Marilyn, appreciate that. I'm going to ask you to take God's Word, find the book of Ephesians this morning, in Ephesians chapter 2. We'll welcome our Facebook family and friends uh, with us this morning, all of our fo folks here on campus and our, our uh, um, friends here as well and guests here this morning. We appreciate you being here. I'm in Ephesians chapter 2 this morning. I'm preaching verse by verse through the book of Ephesians. We've come to chapter 2, verse 11, and I'll be preaching verses 11 through 13 this morning on this subject, because of his blood, because of his blood blood mark harris and randy phillips wrote a song several years ago sung by the contemporary christian group in uh, phillips craig and dean and the title of the song was because of that blood listen to these words earn your way that's the lesson that we're taught but i know things eternal can't be sold and can't be bought amazing grace is something i could never hold and i know love and mercy are outside of my control but I'm reminded of a ransom paid beyond my worth on a hill outside the city where heaven kissed the earth because of that blood, because of that dream, because of that mercy pouring over me, because of that grace I've been set free. Because of you, Jesus, I have been redeemed. Some believe that they can make it on their own, but only in the end to find they're really not that strong. But I believe that, I, that if I choose to live by faith, that God will give me strength to make it each and every day. For we are lost without a Savior to save us from ourselves. For it's only by the grace of God that we can live to tell. Because of that blood, because of that dream, because of that mercy pouring over me, because of that grace I've been set free, because of you, Jesus, I have been redeemed. Who of us can say that we are worthy of the blood of Jesus Christ? All that we can do is simply offer him our own by laying down our lives. Because of that blood, because of that dream, because of that mercy pouring over me, because of that grace I've been set free, because of you, Jesus, I have been redeemed. Redeemed. Paul reminded the church of their past condition without Christ and then about their present position in Christ. The blood of Jesus is all-powerful to save all those who have sep been separated from God by sin. Those who come to him and uh, trust in him are saved by the grace of God. The sin that has separated us from God has been paid in full uh, for the people separated from God have been brought near to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge the lost people today to trust in Jesus, to receive forgiveness uh, through the blood of Jesus. I want to challenge the saints of God to remember who we were. Uh, before Christ and to rejoice in who we, who we now are in Christ. The Bible's going to tell us to do that today. Do you remember your past life? Have you ever come to realize your lost condition? Have you come to, to Jesus for salvation and cleansing and eternal life? And are you thankful today for the blood of Jesus? We're going to get some, in this passage, we're going to see some realities about our past and present because of his blood. I'm going to ask you if you're physically able to stand with me all over the building. Ephesians 2, verse 11 through 13. You follow along now. I'm preaching on this subject because of his blood. The Word of God says, Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Hallelujah and amen. You may be seated. Let's pray together this morning. Father, would you add the blessings to the preaching of your word today? Lord, because of the blood of Jesus, we can draw near to you, and you draw near to us. And I pray, Lord, you'd redeem the lost today, save those who are lost and out of fellowship with you, don't know you today. The day would be the day of salvation. Lord, for the saints of God that's truly been redeemed, let us remember our past life. Let us rejoice today in our present position in Jesus. Let us uh, not take that for granted. Let us worship you and serve you every day with all of, all the, of who we are. So bless your people today as we worship you now through your word. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Well, two calls Paul gives us. A couple calls we're going to look at in this passage. If you're taking notes with me, the first call he tells us, he gives us is a call to remember their past condition. 
I talked about that a little bit in my introduction uh, in verses 11 and 12. There was a call for them to remember their past condition. I, wanna, I see in verse 11 here the identification of the Gentiles. He said, therefore, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh. Now, I've taught you this several times. As, as always, the word therefore is there for a reason. So we need to point, know what it's there for. It points back to what Paul had just said. He just reminded the Ephesians back in verses 8 through 10 that we're saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. Salvation is not of ourselves. It's not of our service. Salvation is the gift of God. Paul clearly denies a works-based salvation. You're not going to work your way to heaven. I'm not going to work my way to heaven. Believers are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. In verse 10, Paul does remind us that works are not a requirement for salvation, but they are a result of salvation. We work for Jesus not to be saved. We work for Jesus because we are saved. If you're working for any other reason, you're working out of the wrong motives. Paul reminded the church that they are God's workmanship, that they've been created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now in verse 11, he gives an identification of the Gentiles. When Paul calls for the Ephesians to remember, he said, therefore remember, he's calling for more of a rec than a recollection in their minds, but a recollection that leads to action based on the memory. Our memory ought to stir us up, is what he's saying. Their memory of their former condition ought to motivate them and move them and inspire them and encourage them to be grateful and thankful and faithful to Jesus. They were to remember their former estate in which they were lost and looked down upon and living separated from God. They were Gentiles in the flesh. That goes for us as well. Uh, by the way, that word Gentiles in the flesh, that's not a term of endearment. <laughs> Uh, matter of fact, the Jews, listen to what William Barclay said about this. He said the Jew had an immense contempt for the Gentile. The Gentiles said the Jews were created by God to be fuel for the fires of hell. God, they said, loved only Israel of all the nations that he had made. It was not even lawful to render help to a Gentile mother in her hour of sorest need. For that would it simply be to bring another Gentile into the world. Until Christ came, the Gentiles were an object of contempt to the Jews. The barrier between them was absolute. If a Jewish bo boy married a Gentile girl, or if a J Jewish girl married a Gentile boy, the funeral of that Jewish boy or girl was carried out. Such contact with a Gentile was the equivalent of death. Now that tells me that the Jews didn't like the Gentile. Amen. I mean, I'm not the smartest. I'm not the smartest tack in the box, but I'm here to tell you they didn't have any love for the Gentiles. Paul's primary audience to, and to the people in Ephesus was to the Gentiles. We too are Gentile. You're either a Jew or you're a Gentile. If you're a Jew, you're not a Gentile. But if you're not a Jew, like me, I'm not a Jew. I'm a Gentile. We're, we were Gentiles in the flesh. So there's the identification. Notice also the indictment on the Gentiles. I, I see here in verse 11 what the indictment was about. He said, who are called uncircumcision. So this was a general term used universally by the Jews of the Gentiles. The Jews referred to the Gentiles as uncircumcised. It was a derogatory term used uh, of them that showed disdain for them. Uh, those old uncircumcised people. Being uncircumcised by the, uh, being called uncircumcised by the Jews was to, to degrade them, to look down on them, to deride them. Matter of fact, it was used by David when he went to fight. You remember that story where he defeated Goliath, that Philistine warrior in 1 Samuel? You remember that good deal, man. That's, good. That's a great story. David, da David, David conquered it. God used him. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Samuel 17, verse 26. The Bible says, Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and take away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? So being of the uncircumcised had many implications in life and in the spiritual sense as well. The Gentiles didn't enjoy benefits and blessings that the Jews did. They were not welcomed by or accepted by or looked up to by the Jews. Notice who this indictment was by. He says, by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. So the Jews spoke down toward the Gentiles, looked down upon the Gentiles. They were not God's chosen people. Uh, they were not the privileged people of God. They were 
Gentiles. Paul identified the Gentiles as the uncircumcised and the Jews as the circumcision. And Paul, being a Jew, full, knew full well of the animosity and the contempt the Jews had for the Gentiles. And he refers to them as the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. So this refers to the Jews who were Jews nationally. They were natural born Jews, but also outwardly. They had gone through the rites and rituals of being a Jew. God required circumcision of the males in the, in the Abrahamic covenant. As a sign of uh, obedience to him, God required circumcision. As a sign of belonging to his covenant people because uh, once circumcised, the man would be identified as a Jew forever. Then also, it was required as a circumcision as a symbol of cutting off the old life of sin, purifying one's heart, and dedicating oneself to God. More than any other practice, circumcision separated God's people from the, the Egyptian and Canaanite peoples that surrounded them. They were to be come out from among them, be separate. They were God's separate people. But they took pride of that, and, and they, they had arrogance because of that. I like what Max Anders said in his commentary on Ephesians. Max Anders said this, Circumcision was a source of pride for the Jews. It was a visible sign of their historic relationship with God. Therefore, it was a term of derision, a religious slur, if you will, for the Jews to call the Gentiles uncircumcised. The Jewish nation had forfeited their spiritual position with God because while they were physically circumcised, their heart attitude was not one of submission to God. So Paul says the Jews were called the circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. He implies that while they were physically circumcised, their heart was not as it were circumcised, submissive to God. We would do well to learn from the Jews not to look down on anyone. Listen to me. Don't look down on anyone because of their race, because of their creed, because of their color, because of their social standing, because of their position or any other thing. We are not looked down on people. May the Lord Jesus remind his church that we are saved by the grace of God and all lost people need to be saved by the same grace that saved us. We're no better than them except we're just saved by the grace of God. The Bible tells us of the identification of the Gentiles, the indictment on the Gentiles. Then see, don't you see in your outline, look, move down to verse 12 with me. We're going to talk about the implication uh, on the Gentiles. Four implications he gives us in verse 12 uh, of being Gentiles. Notice, first of all, their destitution. That's what I see is their destitution, verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ. So Paul details is the implication of being a Gentile. He speaks here of their destitution. The believers were to remember their past condition of when they were without Christ. The time before they were saved, they were destitute. Hey, church, the, before the, the time before you and I were saved, we were destitute. We were. At that time, you see that in verse 12, that at that time it reminds us that there was a time when all of us were destitute. We were all lost and undone, and we were without Christ, every one of us. No one can truly say that they've always been a Christian. If you say that, you're lying. You've not always been a Christian. We are not born saved. We have to be born again to be saved. For some, that time was longer than others, for us others, it was shorter than others, but we have all been for a time in our lives without Jesus Christ. We have all been destitute and in desperate need. The word without means uh, without any association or without any use. It is full separation. Remember back at the days and the years that you were without, that you were destitute. I mean, this is a call for us to remember, not to depress us, Listen to me, but to keep us humble and to keep us focused and faithful and grateful. There was a time that we've all been without. Now, we can be without some things in life that won't hinder us as much as others. If y'all just indulge me for a minute, and you say, oh, preacher, go ahead. And you're going to say that when I tell you this little story. Growing up, you know what? I did without cable television. You say, well, bless your heart, preacher. You okay? I mean, I didn't get to see some of the movie channels. I didn't have ESPN. I, I know, it's so terrible. I missed, I missed a lot of games I could have watched. Growing up in North Alabama, I had CBS, ABC, NBC, and Alabama Public Television. But when I got 12, we got Fox 54, WZDX out of Huntsville, Alabama. That was five stations. 
during that time. I mean, I missed so, so many games I wished I would have been able to see, you know, because it didn't have cable. Hey, young people, I did with that. We didn't have Internet when I grew up. Didn't have no tablets. Didn't have the, I couldn't surf the web. I didn't know nothing about the web. And you know, another thing I didn't have when I was growing up, you can check this on Internet. We don't, nobody has them anymore. I didn't have a pager. Nobody could page me. Nobody wanted to page me, but nobody could page me. Emma said, Mama, what's a pager? He said, bless your heart. Now, on a serious note, a lot of people do without, they do without a home to live in, clothes to wear, things we take for granted, food to eat, three meals a day they're doing without. Those are some serious things. My, my little life, I've been so blessed my life, I, I, I've not really done without much. I mean, that, those things I did without, it, it, it didn't really have an adverse effect on me. But I'll tell you what I did without, what I was without had the biggest effect on me. I was without Jesus in life. I was without him. So were you. We have all been destitute. We've all been in rebellion against Christ. There's been a time in all of our lives that we were without Christ. Sam Gordon said this in his commentary. I'll put this on the screen. He said, that means throughout the whole period B.C., the Gentiles were neither in Christ nor with Christ, but separated from Christ. Did you know you and I, even though we're living in A.D., we've all been B.C.? We've all been in a B.C. even though we're living in A.D. Do you all understand what I'm talking about? There's been a time in your life we've been before Christ, before we knew him, before we came to him. Even though we're living in A.D., we still have been B.C. If, you've been, if you have never recognized that you have never been separated from Christ, it's because you might, you, you've been deceived and your mind's blocked darkened to the truth you've been blinded to the fact that you're without Jesus we've all been in this condition and being without Jesus so we've talked Paul mentions in verse 12 about their destitution then notice in verse 12 about their detachment Se second implication has to do with their detachment two things he says in verse 12 that they're detached from first of all we learned that they were detached from the commonwealth the Bible says that at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel the word aliens there means foreign or not belonging to the same country, land, or government. It means estranged, not allied with, not, but adverse to. May we all remember the time that you and I were illegal aliens. Preacher, I've never been an illegal alien. Well, in God's sight you have, especially to the commonwealth of Israel. All Gentiles have been detached from being citizens of God's kingdom of people on earth. We were all on the outside looking in. Aliens are not citizens and not privy to the rights and privileges of belonging to the country. They're not supposed to be, amen. <laughs> Paul reminds the Gentiles that they have been detached from the commonwealth. The word commonwealth means citizenship. We were all aliens and not citizens of Israel. Gentiles could never fully partake of the spiritual privilege promised to Israel, God's chosen people. But when Gentiles proselyted and became a Jew, they would uh, do so through it by extensive training period. They had to go through an extensive training period, but also they had to be followed through by, the males had to be circumcised, and they had to be followed through baptism. But the sense of exclusion was never fully removed from them. Gentiles could never truly be citizens of Israel. They never was fully accepted. Let me put it in terms that we might understand. It'd be, I sure understand it uh, growing up. Because my dad and mom divorced when I was 13 years old. Mom remarried. My dad remarried. I had a stepmom and a stepdad. And I was a stepchild. Now I know my stepparents tried to love me the best they probably could. But I, there was always a sense that I was a stepchild. And on top of that, I was a redheaded stepchild. <laughs> you don't know like I know. It's almost like playing second fiddle. I mean, hey, fiddler, get on over. We got this main fiddle. We don't need you. I mean, you can do without a second fiddle. No matter what the Gentiles tried to do to convert to Judaism, they, could, they would always, be, in a sense, they would always be like stepchildren. They were, and we all were detached from the commonwealth. There has only been one nation that God called out and blessed and set apart for his own special people, and that is the nation of Israel. Like all the rest of the Gentiles that live in all the nations in all the world, we too have been on the outside looking in. We've been aliens in regard to the commonwealth of Israel. Paul tells the Ephesians that you were aliens. You were, you were 
separated, detached from the commonwealth. Not only that, they were also detached from the covenants. Look in verse 12 again. The Bible says, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Paul reminds the church that once they were detached from the commonwealth, now they're also detached from the covenants. They were aliens and strangers and foreigners separated from the covenants of promise. The word strangers there, the NIV translates that word as foreigners. Xenos is the Greek word. It means foreign or aliens, a stranger. We all have been strangers uh, from the covenants of promise of God, the Abrahamic covenant, the Noah, Noah covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant. Well, we're all given to God and God's chosen nation, Israel. Unbelievers and Gentiles were excluded on the outside, foreigners, aliens, strangers uh, to the covenants of promise. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this. He said, they can read their Bible Speaking about unbelievers, he said, they can read their Bible and it does not move them. They can look at these exceedingly great and precious promises and say, to whom does this apply? What is this all about? Are they, they are strangers. They are like people from another country. They do not understand the language. So the covenant promises were the basis of Israel's distinctive distinction. The, the word covenants there is the word, it's a plural word. It makes the word comprehensive. It speaks of all of God's promises to his people, all the distinctive privileges that were made to his people. The, to these, the Gentiles were foreigners. They were strangers. They were aliens. They had no share or part in the promises of God. None. We have all been aliens and strangers from the covenants of promise made by God to his chosen people. That was our condition before Jesus came to earth and before we came to Jesus. But because Jesus Christ came to earth and died on the cross for our sins, those who trust in him are saved by the grace of God and we brought into the new covenant. That's by the way, you got a New Testament open. You, I'm preaching from it right now. It's also known as the new covenant. I'm preaching about the, from the new covenant today. John Phillips said, true, circumcision was the sign of the Abrahamic covenant made with the nation of Israel, but the church is not Israel. The seal of those who are in the true church is not circumcision in the flesh, but the Holy Spirit in the heart. He says, Gentiles are brought into a covenantal relationship with the God of Israel, not by becoming proselytes to Judaism, but by putting their faith in Christ. The same is true now of Jews. There is no difference. Calvary and Pentecost effected a remarkable change. Gentiles who had no covenantal relationship with the God of Israel, such as the one the Jews enjoyed and in which they made their boast, now have just such a relationship in the new covenant. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. We've all been detached, but now we are joined together in the family of God through faith in Jesus Christ. We need to remember our past condition when we were destitute. We were detached. Number three, I want you to see in your outline their despair. I want to say a word about their despair. Look in verse 12. Paul says, having no hope. Having no hope. Gentiles were without hope because they were without Christ. They were aliens and strangers from the commonwealth of Israel and from the covenants of promise. Their, that was their destitute destitution, their detachment, there was despair, they were without hope. The American Heritage Dictionary defines hope, and I quote, a wish for something with expectation, a desire accompanied with confident expectation, or a happy anticipation of good. They were without hope, any hope. A college student shared his story while attending college. He visited a psychiatric uh, institution with a group of students to observe various types of mental illnesses. The experience proved to be very disturbing to that young man. He remembered one man who was called No Hope Carter. He was a tragic case, a victim of venereal disease. He was going through the final stages when the brain is affected by the disease. Before he began to lose his mind, this man was told by the doctors that there was no known cure for him. He begged for one day of one ray, one ray of light in his darkness, but had been told that the disease would run its inevitable course and would end in death. God, gradually, his brain deteriorated, and he became more and more despondent. When the students saw him in his small, barred room about two weeks before he died, he was pacing up and down in mental agony. His eyes stared blankly. His face was drawn and ashen. Listen, over and over, he muttered these two forlorn and, and faithful words, no hope, no hope, no hope. 
He said nothing else, and no one could pierce the veil of darkness that enveloped him. No hope, Carter. Can I tell you, our world lives with no hope today because they're not trusting in the Prince of Peace. They have no hope. Someone once asked uh, John Newton, who was a slave trader. He was a converted slave trader. God took him from being a slave trader to being a preacher of the gospel. He's well known by writing that great hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Someone asked him, they were talking about despair, and the person asked Newton if, they, if he did not despair of the salvation of some person. Newton replied, I never did despair since God saved me. <laughs> that is what it means to remember, to remember what we were and what we have become and then to expect God to do the same for him. What, what that's saying in our modern-day vernacular, if God saved me, he can save you. And if God saved me, he can save anybody. The church must remember our destitution without Christ, our detachment from the covenants and promises, our despair in the world without hope. If we ever forget, church, who we, are, who we were without Christ, we will not live accordingly in Christ or for Christ. Warren Wiersbe, I'll put this on the screen. Listen, what, this is such a great word. Warren Wiersbe said this, Israel was to be a light to the Gentiles that they too might be saved. But sad to say, Israel became like the Gentiles. And the light burned but dimly. This fact is a warning to the church today. When the church is least like the world, it does the most for the world. Amen. Hey, church, we need to be least like the world so that we can be, do the most for the world in Jesus' name. Those who are outside of Christ have no true and lasting hope in this life or the life to come. Despair is everywhere. And Christians must continue to share the hope that we have in Jesus Christ our Lord. I mean, the world despairs. The world despairs over money, over temporary problems, over family problems, over health issues. The world's despairing over a virus. Uh, the world despairs over rogue nations and over uh, lo the loss of loved ones, and the list goes on and on. I mean, despair is everywhere. Andrew Telfer said they were faced with five awful facts in verse 12. Without Christ, without citizenship, without covenants of promise, without the Creator, without the Christian's hope. Those who are outside of Jesus Christ have no real hope. We must pray and share and give and support and go and tell the good news. The Lord Jesus is the hope of glory. And the Lord Jesus is the only hope of glory. The only hope. Let me ask you, are you without hope today? There's good news that you must hear and believe and a person you must trust and receive. And his name's Jesus. Christ came to, to give you eternal life. He paid for your sin debt on the cross. He died in our place. He rose again. He lives forevermore as Lord. He wants to save you, and he will save you as you turn from your sin to Jesus. As you trust in him, he'll forgive you of all your sin and give you eternal life. I said it earlier, it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone that we're saved. The Bible tells us of the Gentiles' plight, their implications of being a Gentile, their destitution. We've learned about their detachment. I said a word about their despair. Number four, don't you see in your outline about their desperation. Look in the last part of verse 12. The Bible says, and without God in the world. They were desperate shape. They were without God in the world. Paul continues to remind the church of their past condition of, of being dis in desperate straits without God in the world. Now, the Ephesians, you go back and read the book of Acts, they were pagans. It ain't that they didn't have any gods in the world. They worshiped false gods. They worshiped the false god Artemis and the false goddess Diana at the temple of Diana. They worshiped. It's not like they didn't have any gods in the world, but they didn't have the one true God in the world. The world is full of false and dead and lifeless idols today. But the lost is without the one true and living God in the world. John R. Stott said this. I put this on the screen. He said, there are some things which Scripture tells us to forget, like the injuries which others do to us. But there is one thing in particular which we are commanded to remember and to never forget. He said, this is what we were before God's love reached down and found us. For only if we remember our former alienation, distasteful as some of it, it, of it may be to us, shall we be able to remember the greatness of the grace which forgave and is transforming us. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. Christians, we need to remember our past condition when we were without God in the world. Now listen, God's omnipresent. That means God's everywhere. There, 
in the first century when Paul wrote this to the letter to the church of Ephesus, God was everywhere then too. God was there in Ephesus. But they were without God in the world. God was everywhere in the world, but they were in the world without God. That's, that describes the whole world. God's everywhere, but they're without God in the world. They go about their lives with no thought of the Lord, no worship of the Lord, no trust in the Lord, no reliance upon the Lord, no dependence on the Lord, no faith in the Lord. They are without God's personal presence, power, purposes, and promises in the world. Paul called on the Ephesian Christians to remember their past condition. We need to remember our past condition when we were destitute, detached, despaired, and desperate. We've all been without God in the world. But I got good news. That's the first point. So that's the first call. We are called to remember our past condition. Number two, Paul gives a second call in verse 13. I want you to see in your outline with me. Number two, second call, we are called to recognize our present position. They were called to recognize their present position. And see in verse 13 there, if you're taking notes with me, the person of their redemption. Paul says, but now, but now, in Christ Jesus. I mean, but now is a conjunction of contrast from what they were before Christ to what they now are in Christ. Thank God for those conjunctions that point us to what we have and who we are in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We were dead, we were doomed, we were destitute, we were detached, we were depraved, we were in despair, we were desperate without God, but now in Jesus we are saved and sealed and secure in Christ. Hey, listen, church, that word now, verse 13, but now also reminds us that eternal life and forgiveness of sins and cleansing and life is experienced now, not just later. You ain't got to wait to die to get it. If you got it, you already got it. The Ephesian Christians were now redeemed. They were saved now, set free, forgiven, and assured of heaven now. Let that fact sink deep in your heart and rejoice in Jesus today. The believers were to recognize their present position in Christ Jesus. The great English preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon told of a man who had been sentenced to death by the Spanish courts. Because he was an American citizen, and, but also he was English birth, the consuls of both countries decided to intervene. They declared that the authorities in Spain had no right to take his life, but their protest went unheeded. Finally, they deliberately wrapped the prisoner in the flags, the stars and stripes, and the Union Jack. To find the ex executioner, they issued this warning, Fire if you dare. But if you do, you will bring the powers of two great nations upon you. There stood the condemned, but the riflemen would not shoot, protected by those flags and governments that they represented, protected by, wrapped in the flags of the American flag and the British flag. He was protected. Can I tell you something greater than that? Uh, by the blood of Jesus Christ, we are protected from all enemies, from all harm. In Jesus, we have been redeemed from our sin, and by his blood we have been washed clean, and we are protected from all eternal harm. We stand redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And listen, all the enemy's accusations, and there are many, all the enemy's fiery darts, and there are many, all the enemy's schemes and attacks can never condemn us and kill us and take us from being in Christ. Hallelujah. Are you now in Christ Jesus today? I, I, I'm asking you a personal question. That's, the pastor's asking every one of you at the same time a personal question. If you are not now in Christ Jesus in this life, then you will not be in Christ Jesus in the life to come. You have to be saved now while you're alive. There's no do-overs after death. You have to be saved and forgiven and cleansed and redeemed now. Those who turn to Jesus and trust in Jesus are saved by Jesus and are now in Christ Jesus. He's the person of our redemption. Then notice the power of their redemption and our power of our redemption. He said, but now in Jesus Christ, but now in Christ Jesus, you were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Paul calls on the church to recognize their present position. Now, now it's a present position. We were once far off. That's where we used to be. But now through the blood of Jesus, he's brought us near. Uh, James tells us, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Only because of Jesus Christ can we draw near to God. And only because of Jesus Christ can God draw near to us. We were reminded that we were once far off. We were detached. We were distant. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. But now in Christ Jesus, we've been saved, brought near, forgiven, and given eternal life. Woo! I'm about ready to have a cheerleading spell. 
I'm not even a cheerleader. Roy Gingrich said in his commentary, I put this on the screen, and he said, the unsaved Gentiles were far off from God, and the unsaved Jews were nigh to God in the same sense that the unsaved children of pagan homes in Africa are far off from God, and the unsaved children in Christian homes in America are nigh to God. In both cases, we refer not to a geographical nearness, but to a privileged nearness. So if you've got a Christian mom and dad that's bringing you up in a Christian home, you ought to thank God for that because you have an opportunity to hear the gospel and be saved. That's why we need to send missionaries to those countries that don't hear the gospel so those people can hear and be saved. We have all been far off and needed to be brought near. All those who are saved by the Lord Jesus are cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus. We've been brought near to God. I mean, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. He died for our sins, and His blood was, sh blood was shed for us, and His blood washes away all of our sin and our guilt and our shame. I stood condemned, but now I stand clean. I, st I stood dead, but now I stand alive and redeemed. We've been brought near into the family of God, and we have been made children of God. By the blood of Jesus, we have been bought now. And by the blood of Jesus, we have been brought near. Sam Gordon said when the rabbis spoke about accepting the convert into Judaism, they said that he had to be brought near. For instance, the Jewish rabbin rabbinic writers tell how a Gentile woman came to Rabbi Eleazar. She confessed that she was a sinner and asked to be admitted to the Jewish faith. Rabbi, she said, bring me near. But the rabbi refused. The door was shut in her face. But now the door is open. His precious blood shed for us at Calvary has enabled us to come right into the immediate presence of God. We're in the presence of God because of the blood of Jesus. Someone wrote, so near, so very near to God, near I cannot be. For in the person of his Son, I am as near as he. Have you been brought near? We are to remember our past condition. Then we're also to recognize our present position. There are those who were far off have been brought near because of the blood of the Lamb. Listen, let me remind you that we've not been brought near to God by our service or by our sacrifice. We've not be been brought to near to God by any amount of giving that we might have done, by any work or toil or doing that we might have done. We are brought near by the blood of the Lamb of God. That means, listen, church, we're not brought near by our baptism, our church membership. We're not brought near by our memory verses learned, our prayers offered, our poor people helped, our money given, our kindness shown, or our attendance records at church, or anything else. Those are good things, but they don't bring us near. We're only brought near to, to God by the blood of the Lamb of God, only through the blood of Jesus. Have you been brought near? Charles Wendell, I'm closing. Charles Wendell had a good word. He said, we were once Christless, but now we are in Christ Jesus. We were once stateless, but now we are full citizens. We were once friendless, but now we are members of God's family. We were, we were once hopeless, but now we are promised a glorious future. We were once godless, but now we can call God our Father. Because of the blood of the Lamb. All because of the blood of Jesus, we're saved and secure and brought near to God. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing flood? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Step one, remember your past condition when you were lost. Step two, recognize your present position now. You are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Christian, remember, rejoice. Respond to Jesus today. If you can't remember your past condition because you're still in that mess today, Jesus came to set you free, to forgive you. Life. Say, preacher, I love my life. I love my sin. You can't love the sin and love the Savior. You have to break. It has to be a break. You have to come to faith in Christ and be born again. You have to realize it was your sin and my sin and the world's sin that nailed Jesus to the cross. Ask him to forgive you. He paid the penalty 2,000 years ago. It's been paid in full. You just have to receive the payment in full by trusting in Jesus. Say, so, preacher, is that all I have to do? Yes, the Holy Spirit's working in your heart. 
You may not understand all that's going on in your heart today, but he's here. He honors his word, and he convicts us of sin. He's showing you your need to being saved today. Call upon the name of the Lord right where you are today. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. God wants you to be saved. Jesus did what, all, all the work so that you can be saved. Now come to him and be saved. Now, church, I want to say a word to you before I close. R recognize our past condition. Don't dwell in it. Don't, don't get depressed by it. But be inspired that God loved you even while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. And he changed us. He's still working on us, but he's changed us. We're not what we used to be. Amen. Remember your past commitment. Paul tells the Ephesians to do that. Remember who you were, Gentiles of the flesh. We were destitute. We were desperate without Christ. Surrender your life to Jesus today and live for him. Because of his blood, we have been brought near. Father, thank you today for the blood of the Lamb of God that was shed on the cross 2,000 years ago for our sins. Thank you that Jesus paid it all and all to him we owe. And Lord, if there's any in this building under the sound of my voice today that have never been washed in the blood of the Lamb, that have never been to Jesus for cleansing and forgiveness. Today, Lord, as you draw them, that they'd have faith and believe that they'd turn to you from their sins and believe on, the, believe on the good news of the gospel that Jesus saves. Lord, I pray that you would remind us as believers of our past condition. When we were lost, when we looked down upon, when we were dead and destitute without you, God. Thank you, Lord, that you reached down, that you came down, that you paid the price for our sins. Let us rejoice in Jesus and never waver. Lord, inspire your saints today. Uplift them. Uphold them uh, in our faith today. Let us be strong in the Lord and the power of your might. Let us rejoice in our cleansing. And we can draw near to you, Lord, because of the blood of the Lamb of God. And we rejoice, O oh God, in your Son, in your love for us. And we bow before you today. Work in this invitation time, Lord, as we ask the question, are you washed? In the blood of the Lamb, let us respond today in faith. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me all over the building? We're